Welcome back. This is episode two. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's podcast as well as the Pitsy Pod episode that was released. I know the title kind of gives it away, but this is a great subject. Today we're going to talk with Stephanie Pichet. She's a chef, a wine instructor, entrepreneur, and of course, she's the podcast host of Flying for Flavor, which is a travel and wine podcast. In this podcast, I interview scholars, enthusiasts, professors, amateurs, librarians, students, academics, and just so many more. I love talking to people who are passionate about a topic, whether it's a location they visited, something they studied, or anything in history, really. As you may have noticed, not all the episodes are Canadian history, but I am. So yeah, I'm Rosie. I'm a Francophone from Canada, and this is my podcast. So grab your champagne, and let's do some history, eh? So today we're with Stephanie Pichet, and she is uh, quite the wine connoisseur. As I've mentioned in the intro, we kind of know a little bit about her already, but I'd like her well to present her topic. Okay, I, I like to call myself a wine geek. It sounds a little <laughs> bit more um, sounds a little bit more informal, okay, right? As okay. opposed to wine connoisseur, it sounds a little snobbish, and that's not me. So you don't spit the wine in the other glass when you drink it? No, no, She's like, no. don't waste wine. No, don't waste, not even waste wine. Don't take more than you can handle. It's yeah, the easiest yeah, yeah. one. Uh, no, I was excited to talk about uh, one of my favorite elixirs. Most luxurious thing is champagne, and I always been fascinated with. Not only the story behind champagne and you know how those bubbles came about, but more about all the people and the stories that have always come from centuries ago and decades ago and through wars and royalty. And it's just, it's touched so many parts of our history as human beings that it's just, it's got a life of its own. So I always thought it was a good thing. It's a small thread that we haven't really noticed until today. Hopefully we can... Uh, Sipping along with a good (laughs) glass of bubbles when they listen to this. Yeah, you never know. I was thinking we can start right at the beginning. I don't know much about wine. Okay. Um, As a child, my dad made blueberry wine, but I don't really remember the process that much. Uh, It would be the similar idea. So, I mean, grapes are, of course, the the main component that's Mm -hmm. usually used in wine. But yes, you can make wine out of blueberries. Just about any fruit. Or dandelions. Dandelions, that's (laughs) right. Just about anything can be made in a fruit. And essentially, it's just been fermented. Okay. Um, The natural sugars that are in there, Mm -hmm. um, that's what turns into alcohol. And it's just this magic of... Um, nature that actually turns that into so you know a little bit of warmth and things bubbling along and then that fermented sugar the yeast and sugar and all kind of magically goes together I think the easiest way to describe it is that just about anything can be fermented Um, by coincidence I was just talking about pickles with some and fermentation is part of that same process Mm -hmm. so when they pick the grapes just like they would do the blueberries right they put it in a big tub and they're basically mashing them up a little bit which releases the sugar and everything else and they add a touch of yeast to it and the yeast of course are living organisms yes so they're looking for that sugar and it sounds disgusting but the (laughs) the yeast are actually um, expelling gas And so that's part of the fermentation process. So it's actually creating, and that's how the alcohol portion of it is created. And then depending on the winemaker, they may take those final products and mix them together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are um, adding extra sugar to it. Sometimes they are... Different grapes? Uh, yeah, you can add yeah. different grapes. There's no rule saying you have to use one varietal. You can use many. Mm-hmm. And then depending on soil types, the weather, I mean, even one grape planted with by the same winemaker in two different plots of land. So maybe one near 50, the ocean, one in the mountains? That will, you'll see an extreme difference. Okay. Uh, but it's surprising how even next door neighbors, if they planted the same thing, depending on the changes in the soil type, depending mm. on the slope, how much sun it's Water getting, content. everything, yeah. it can really make a difference. So for an experienced palate, I just think they're I all good. I would not good. know. <laughs> they're all good. Yeah, I'm sure they don't make it. <laughs> exactly. So that would be the basis to making the wine. That's right. Um, or how wine is made. And we're specifically talking about champagne, so that's a, a bit of a different process or a different thing? It's just an additional process. Okay. Uh, so if you want to get technical about it, uh, champagne itself uh, is the sparkling wine made in the Champagne region of France. Mm-hmm. So legally, um, there's a set of international laws that 
allows that area to be the only place on the earth that's allowed to call that what they make their champagne. Mm -hmm. So every other country has a different name for it, um, but that's why overall everyone just calls it sparkling wine to be easy. There's usually three main grapes that are in there. Chardonnay is one of the biggest ones. Everyone knows that, the white mm -hmm. wine grape. Pinot Noir is actually a red grape that's used. And then the other one is a Pinot Meunier, which is rarely used for anything else but the champagne process and just adds a little bit more fruitiness and um, acidity to the wine. So they kind of mix all the different ones. And then there's rules, of course, just like every wine region of what the proportions can be. Um, Alcohol content? A little bit, yeah. So yeah. there's a whole set of rules to be able to be called champagne. You have to check all these boxes. Mm -hmm. So that's just the basics of the rules. It reminds me a lot of scotch, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> having done distilleries, you know, it's very specific rules and only the scotch. It's exactly, but that's exactly and, the yeah. same thing, right? Just talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about bourbon and bourbon, same exactly. Thing, yeah. A whiskey has very specific rules. Mm -hmm. So the process for champagne, the traditional method is essentially once you made that wine like we just talked about what they will do is they put the wine in the bottle and then the yeast after it finishes eating and dies and hangs out on the bottom <laughs> um, all of that stuff that's left there is called the lees so they want to get that out of the bottle it's all the nasty foggy dirty <laughs> bits right so um, I'll tell you a little bit about the history about the, how this happened later, but essentially that part is removed um, with a disgorgement process. And then they'll quickly recork it again, adding a touch more sugar, whatever else to kick start it again. And then it goes through a second fermentation process that's in the bottle and that's how it sits okay. waiting until. So it always goes through two fermentation processes. Okay, so that would be how you get the bubbles. That's how the bubbles come in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so how did that start? Wines have been around since, you know, at least the pharaohs, I think, is how far Correct. back we've done. So, I mean, wine has always been not just used for royalty and celebrations and everything over mm -hmm. centuries. I mean, centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. But it was also used for, say, royalty churches yes, and all ceremonies, faiths, ceremonies that mm -hmm. kind of thing. We're always using wine for that. And, of course, in most of Europe and, of course, eventually North America, most of those churches were usually run by monks. Mm -hmm. So the monks were in charge of making the wine. That's part of, that was their day job, essentially, aside from yeah. doing the other stuff. There's some babysitting involved in the winemaking? There's a, yes, there's a long process yeah. of it. So uh, there was a, everyone's heard the story of Dom Perignon. It's not just the yes. name <laughs> of the um, champagne, but Dom Perignon himself. There's always been this fantasy story out there about how he... You know, he's the champion. There's statues of him over in France. Oh, really? oh yeah. I actually stood beside his grave marker <laughs> in the little church. He's put on this huge pedestal, literally, mm -hmm. as the, you know, the godfather of champagne. But actually, he spent most... He discovered it by accident, and he got in so much trouble from the rest of the monks... <laughs> because that's not the style that they wanted. They wanted ceremonial wines. They wanted just him to produce more wine and more wine and more wine because they needed it for all of the masses mm -hmm. and weddings and royal things and other celebrations. Mm -hmm. So he took, partly because in that area of France, so the Champagne region is actually about east of Paris, if you want to look on a map, mm -hmm. and slightly north of that. And that climate up there, it gets pretty cold. Mm -hmm. And because it gets so cold there, Dom Perignon was having a difficulty keeping it at a decent temperature so it wouldn't freeze so the yeast would stop activating because if you don't yeah. have any heat or warmth that fermentation process slows down to a stop that's why you put your yeast in the fridge when you want to you want in between bread making and yes stuff. exactly yeah. it's all chemical it's all right? chemical yeah. so to he started making additional wine in advance to sort of counteract so you'd always have some that's sitting and waiting mm. because a lot of times it would have to wait through the cold winter and then that fermentation process would start all over again or it would continue starting once it started to warm up again yeah. right in the spring so he would basically let it sit for that whole time but as it's been sitting in there and then finally when they opened it that fermentation process produced bubbles because it was like a second fermentation so he thought mentioned. it was and because it was <laughs> bubbling and it was like popping corks it was breaking bottles it was hurt injuring people it, I mean they used to call it the devil's wine because it was always I mean it was always it was explosive injury. it was very explosive <laughs> he was desperately trying to he tried everything to blending grapes which people adopted okay. later he tried all these magic things or researching and just like a chemist would in the lab trying to figure out like how can I get this wine to stay fermented and do all this thing but then it slowly like somebody tried it and they liked it and then somebody else tried it and then they said oh well, I guess it's not that bad if they like it. But back then, it was very sweet. So that process that, that he kind of created became so well known because it was so unique. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and once they started realizing that, okay, it's not changing the flavor as much, but it's just enhancing it. And because during that process, remember he was experimenting, sometimes mm -hmm. he was removing skins. Okay. Right? So he ended up with this all white wine. From a red grape. From red grapes. Yeah. Because two of the three of those main ones I mentioned are red grapes. Mm -hmm. So by removing the skins, it, there was no color to it. So the color is in the skin. Yeah. Exactly. Well, this is a side note, <laughs> um, but that's one of, that's the magic of rosé wine. Everyone thinks that it's always red and white mixed together. There's still people out there that do. And I always try to tell, especially um, manly men who are scared to drink pink wine, <laughs> that they shouldn't be afraid of it because it's just red wine. All they did was leave the skins in long enough to get the blush color, and oh, then they okay. remove it. And that gives a different taste, too. Yeah, So, but it's mm -hmm. always made usually with red, red grapes. wine, red grapes. Mm. So rosé wine, next time you're having it, you can just say, yeah. a glass of red. It's the same thing. I'll know about it So now. it's less tannins, <laughs> less tannins, right? Oh, people right? who are allergic. Or, or not just allergic, or don't like that really oh, overly yes. tannic dryness. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an easier way of enjoying a red grape is by having it as rosé. And you still probably have the benefits of the red grape. Yes and no, a because a lot, of the, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the nutritional benefits, are, unfortunately, are still in, in the, the skin. skin. Oh, you can't win. <laughs> so it's still better for you to have still it red. White. That's yeah. right. It's like a so white rose red in that yeah. order. Okay. So one of the cool things about the history of all of this, um, people don't realize how much women were involved in the champagne industry back then. So it wasn't just the monks. It was the monks who started it. The monks it that off. started it off. Mm -hmm. um, but as things became popular, um, this was true also in the wine industry, but the French women. And it has to do with this crazy little legal loophole that women in France, if you were a widow, you were allowed to own property, run your own business, take care of the family stuff, um, take care of your own money. Basically, you were allowed to be independent. That was like in the 1600s, I think. Yeah, so, only, yeah, yeah. so only widows that were allowed to do that in mm -hmm. France. So if you uh, if you left your husband or whatever, that did count. If you yeah. were single, it didn't count. Basically, you had to be a widow to get all of those rights. So a lot of widows who ended up either inheriting the vineyards lands or their husband had started it and then passed away unexpectedly, had to either keep up the family business, mm -hmm. figure out new ways to sell it. And because women are natural multitaskers, <laughs> Uh, and also because of the creativity and it's, I mean, there's a big disputes out there, but a lot of people have said they've read places that women naturally have better palates than men do to oh. tell the difference between them. Who knows, right? Right. But even then, yeah. even when these wives were married before their husbands passed away, the men were the ones who were out looking for sales. So right, they were the ones who would they go and schmooze. They were the merchants. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to stay home and basically tend to the fields, check on the wine, mm -hmm. um, basically babysit it, as you say, yeah. do the tasting, all that kind of thing. So the women were always traditionally the winemakers back then. So a woman who was a widow and got the fields or inherited the mm -hmm. fields, she already knew the day-to-day -day process. Most likely. Correct. But now she had to take on the business part of things yeah. as well. But only widows were allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So one of the most famous ones, of course, is Veuve Clicquot. Mm -hmm. So because Veuve is widow, widow. in French, right? Mm -hmm. So that one of the wines. So now when you see that blazing yellow label on there, you'll mm -hmm. be able to know the story about uh, Widow Clicquot. One of the things that she was known for is that method that I was telling you about from Dom Perignon, about that second fermentation and mm -hmm. the process, that in between stage about how to remove the lees, that was her. Okay. Because she because she figured out how to make champagne so popular, um, basically by selling it to the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the Russians were in between wars. She had to yes, they yeah. were. So she actually went through by Amsterdam, and she was waiting until certain wars things were finished. And so she was actually waiting there with cases and cases and cases ready to go. So as soon as she was allowed to cross the border, she basically she, <laughs> she raced across, and they loved it, and she managed to get it in front of the Tsar Alexander the first. Okay. And it, and because he loved it, now as soon as a royal likes it, everyone follows suit. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Now it's trendy. Yeah. So she raced back and now she's like, okay, uh, the demand is so high. How am I going to speed up that process? And if mm -hmm. you remember, Don Perignon is trying to make the wine, he's making it, letting it sit, right? And then he has to, he was always either straining it into other bottles. And he bottles was, were exploding. Yeah. So there yeah. was just, but there was just no way of getting out that clear final product mm -hmm. out of the way that he was doing it. So she figured out that if I can get all of that sediment to go down to the neck of the bottle mm -hmm. and then you freeze the neck of the bottle and when you open the cap after that first fermentation, the natural bubbles that were already in there pushes out that little ice cube full of sediment. Yeah. And then so they quickly, so she figured out that's how to do it fast. And then she quickly put in um, either additional wine that she had left over from that same batch or something just to top up the bottle. Mm -hmm. And then she put the final cork in with the cage on top. That's quite the so, process. I know. Yeah. So that's how it's still made today. That is the traditional really? method. So when you see 
um, method traditionnel on mm -hmm. bottles, that is what they're referring to. So they're freezing the top of the bottles and then adding Correct. a little bit of wine. So there used it. to be this thing called, and she also designed it, and she called it a riddling rack. Mm -hmm. So it, you sometimes you can see pictures of it online, but essentially it was like a big A-frame of wood with holes cut in it that were somewhat sloped so that when you put the neck of the bottles in, they were facing downwards yes. about a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And it was always somebody's job. I used to laugh when we go, I actually have gone into these, um, a lot of these old vineyards underground and I'm into the caves and I'm watching, like, you see pictures of them and someone's job is to turn them quarter turn every so often yeah. every day all day so that nothing settles on the bottom yeah. right so it eventually would just force its way down to the neck of the <laughs> bottle they make machines for that now yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank god um she figured out how to do that so that was her contribution to it besides that of basically launching this big because once the russian royalty started using champagne other royals of course wanted to yes. use it and then it just sort the of demand. spiraled yeah. the demand mm -hmm. so there was a lot of other women that kind of came in after that but they all kind of went into their own way. And I think the marketing part of it is what fascinated me. Once you went to the Russians, there was Louise Pomery. She decided to focus on the English, but she also knew that the English liked things drier. And as I said, remember back then, they liked things a lot sweeter. So it was, um, oh, I'm trying to use an Like not a nice wine, not that sweet. It was pretty oh, really? close okay. to it, yes. It was yeah, a very high sugar very content sweet. and the mm -hmm. English don't like it that sweet. Mm -hmm. Back then even, they were drinking things like dry cider and stuff. So they're used sure. to a drier palate. So she's the one that said, I'm wondering if I could cut back on the sugar. And still get the bubbles. And still get the bubbles. So she did. She cut back on the sugar. And then when that's, before that second fermentation process, a lot of winemakers were adding extra sugar to yes. it. Yes. And she never did. So that she ended up selling it to the English who were ecstatic that they could have <laughs> the same thing, but something that they actually loved. Yeah. It's called Brut Champagne. That style is still actually consumed. Yeah. That's one of the most I've popular. I've actually had that. Yeah. I think 70% of all the sales are actually Brut Champagne that's yeah. been sold. And then there's another lady. Have you ever heard of the champagne called Laurent Perrier? I think so, yeah. Okay, so the lady who owned that, her Mathilde Emily Laurent Perrier, mm -hmm. she's the one that created even the next step further than that, which is called non-dosage. So dosage is the name of the addition of sugar. That's like dosing in. sugar. Exactly. Sugar so you can mm -hmm. actually still see there's a lot of wine. Sometimes if you ever wanted to just Google wines that have non-dosage, you can actually get it not just in champagne, but other sparkling wines are actually experimenting. So for somebody with diabetes, that would be a very it's a very yeah. Thing. So it's, yeah. Yeah, so you're looking at non-dosage, meaning no additional sugar added, and it's basically... So just, as no natural yeah um you can also look for extra brute is usually extra dry so it's some, it, usually it's going to be fairly similar yeah, but non-dosage is the traditional name for it so she okay. was the one that started that huh. which is okay. kind of cool mm -hmm. and then the last one i thought was kind of cool is that lily bollinger so bollinger is also another big champagne house mm -hmm. in that area and Lily figured out that it was a, another marketing ploy that if she managed to sell one that was just recently disgorged. Remember I said after that first fermentation yeah. process? So in other words, it's only it been sit sitting long. for a long yeah. period of time. It was a way to spoil your guests by saying like, I just, we just recently we disgorged. Just bottled it. It. So it was yeah. actually called, so recently disgorged, it was actually called RD, like it was just a term. <laughs> Um, so that was basically just a next level up of status to say, I just had a recently disgorged Bollinger champagne, right? Mm -hmm. So she created that status for that. So everyone kind of created their own little status. The women were very good merchants too then and very good advertisers. Yeah, but it was almost, I think because of their situation, they had to make money with the land that they had. Mm -hmm. They were forced into it. The businesses were, it doesn't matter how much they loved it. They had no choice. That's the mm -hmm. way they had to make the living, especially if they had children and yeah. families and, and other people they were to support. supporting And the workers, else, yeah. and not to mention the workers themselves right that you the villages like, yeah the people mm -hmm. that are surrounding businesses who relied on that industry Absolutely. I mean every agricultural business has so many moving parts to it and yes. suppliers and customers and everything else that all kind of rely on it so it's just it's kind of fascinating to see how women are basically the ones who kind of ruled the world back then <laughs> when it came to champagne <laughs> yes exactly for sure mm. yeah and this is not a topic where we talk about often and it's never something you'll hear in history class there's not a lot of uh, no, but information there, about no, women in history in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, but I also find it fascinating that even champagne itself was not, or the wine industry, the history part of it, you don't really find. I've, I've always been looking for books on it. Mm -hmm. So if any of your listeners have books to recommend, send them to me, please. <laughs> yeah. But I read a book a while back about during World War II, one of the things that the Nazis were doing was actually going house to house in, when they were in France. 
they were looking for wine. Thought about that, yeah. yeah. So there, I know there was. I watched a movie once before about it. There was like a not quite a Semi documentary, documentary kind yeah. of, but it was based on stories of families and how they were they were digging holes. They were cellars. putting them in old graves. Oh they were gosh. yes. So even to this day, there's a lot of really old, not just champagne producers, but wine producers, even in France, over in Europe. That if you happen to inherit land or it used to be a winery at one time, they're still finding, you know, almost like under the wine that's, that was hidden to keep them hmm. away from the Germans. I know they found some wine from the Egyptians at one point and they tried it. I think somebody actually tried it. Okay, I don't know oh, if I would try it. Serious. I know, I, it would probably be so brown. <laughs> I feel like that would not be something I'd want to try. It'd be pretty old. Yeah, I've, I'm trying to think of, I've tried port from 1919. Oh, wow. It was actually really good. So it's properly corked, properly kept then. Correct. Well, the higher the alcohol content, it's slower it takes for it to... So if, let's say I'm not a wine drinker, as you know, mm-hmm. and I don't know much about wine. So if I were to go to the store and I'm looking at a wine that's newer versus a wine that's older, what would be sort of the differences between the two? I know it's not quite champagne, but... No, no, but just on general wine. So most white wines are made, produced to be consumed young. Okay. So I always tell people not to bother going to the big fancy sections unless you're looking for some a specific, specific wine. Yeah. If you're just looking for white wine to have with dinner, a lot of the great ones are right in that general listing section in the center of the LCBO, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, same LCBO th- being our Ontario. Oh, yes, for <laughs> Ontario. For those of you who are outside of Ontario, yeah. we're the crazy people up here that actually yeah. our government controls our liquor stores, and that's a whole other episode. Yes. So it's provincial. Our provincial <laughs> liquor store is the Correct. LCBO. Every province has their own. And, yeah. Um, in that store, they have a like a, just a general area. Mm-hmm. So. So it would be like going to a corner store to go buy them. So most white wines are actually sold that way. You'll get specific vintages that wine producers will release that will be like made. A special edition? Special edition or mm-hmm. special vintages or this Chardonnay from this particular, this deserves better status. I see. So everyone's kind of older necessarily though. It's not necessarily for whites. Okay. Now reds, some do better with age. There's mm-hmm. an old adage, things like, um, I've been told before that you should never have a Barolo that's less than, uh, never even try it until it less is 10 years old. Or actually so would you buy it and then wait? Yeah, there's a lot you of people can? who do that. Yeah, yeah. there's okay. people who have like cellars full of wine. My brother actually, he'll collect the same wine. It's called a vertical, so from different years. So he's got, you know, oh, I need a, next time you're at a store or someplace, Get and this, you look yeah. for, I'm looking for a 2011 of this particular wine to fill in his vertical. And I keep thinking, like, just drink it. Yeah. I know, that's just me. But well, I feel like that's a good idea to just drink it. Exactly. But for the older wines, um, they will, they turn darker in color usually. Do I've had an older stronger? white. They do because yeah. again, it's still doing its thing, yeah. but it's it's going very very slowly because that cork is still allowing a very minute bit of oxygen in it, mm-hmm. so it's still allowing a little bit so of. So that's that why process. you have a cellar with cold to kind of slow down any kind of yeast activity that might happen. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. So cellar temperature is the mm-hmm. is the proper one, and I always find that wine stores will always give you a recommendation, especially for older wines that you should be consuming this between this year and this year. Okay. Or tasting notes do mm-hmm. usually or notes that come along with the sale of the wine. So a wine connoisseur or an expert of some sort, some or, wine or whatever, <laughs> wine geeks. No, no, but I don't make up the dates of no, when no. you should be consuming it. But a lot of them, if you ever read tasting notes, they always say drink between this date and this date. Mm-hmm. And it's just based on certain years. Yes. So let's talk specifically about champagne. Is an age also a thing? Yeah, champagne, definitely you can hold on to it for longer periods of time. Will it explode? <laughs> uh, no, because they're made, they're, they're done with heavy, heavy bottles. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the bottles are designed, the corks are designed. As long as it's been stored properly, you're usually fine for a long period of time. Now, the difference is, is that most champagnes that you buy or you see in just regular stores, y- you'll notice they don't have a year on them. Yeah. Because that means that they've been blended with different wines from different years. Mm-hmm. So usually wine producers will either buy the wine or buy the grapes <clears throat> over there and then they will kind of mix and match to create mm-hmm. the final product. But it's not necessarily, unless the grapes and are exactly what they were looking for for from one particular vintage or year, mm-hmm. then they will make a vintage wine of that style that the year. sparkling wine. Yeah. So the so for champagne, so if you can if you find like you know a two thousand and ten champagne of a particular producer, mm-hmm. that producer has determined that the grapes that we picked from that particular year were so good that we didn't want to touch it with anything else. So this is a superior wine. So you'll find that the ones that have that late year on them are they're considered mm-hmm. vintage champagnes. They'll be higher in price than the other oh, ones. Oh, obviously, yeah. yeah. Because it's but, a very limited run. Correct. So some people will collect them. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah. I'm, and just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Whereas you start storing them for so long and I'm thinking, how long am I going to keep these things? I just yeah. want to drink them. That's yeah, part of the no, process. Absolutely. I did save a bottle once. I found a bottle in Spain, probably... 
10 years ago and it was a 1970 which is my birth year mm -hmm. and I actually forgot about it in my cellar for quite a while and we even asked the own store owner at the time if I thought it was good and he just shrugged his shoulders he wow. went I don't know <laughs> so I brought it home I thought well it'd be a good experiment and I think it was about two or three years ago I finally said, you know what, maybe I should finally open that bottle. I remember I had some friends over and we all got to taste it. And I was just, I was so Florida. It was so amazing. If anyone's had older wine like that, it's surprising that it's not that red color that you would expect. Oh, no. It's like a reddish brown. Huh. Right? So it gets, it gets a darker brown. It's like a darker, a it's a, it's a, no, it's not even, it does, it, the clarity is still there, mm -hmm. but it's a darker color. So it's like mm. the reddish brown. Um, and it also gets lighter in color. Red wines will get lighter. It's so bizarre. It's like this lighter. Yeah. yeah it's kind of so like a lighter brown rather than a darker red. Yes, I know. Is it, isn't that <laughs> weird? weird yeah. So then the white wines, like the reverse, they get darker. Okay. They get like a dark, darker, browny yellow. Guess so this... they eventually probably all get brown. <laughs> they probably do. <laughs> kind of like never... when you leave grapes on the counter and they all get brown, <laughs> brown eventually. eventually. Yeah. Yeah, they all turn to mush. Yeah. Um, I had a really cool quote that I thought would be yes. kind of fun to share. So this quotes. was by uh, Lily Bollinger. Mm -hmm. So that lady I told you about the recently disgorged and she was just, she's very cheeky. Um, so she was actually quoted in the Daily Mail in 1961, and she said, I drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I drink it when I'm alone, when I have company. I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it if I'm not hungry, and I drink it when I am. Otherwise, I never touch it, unless I'm thirsty. <laughs> Anyways, that's one of those that's things. Really I would funny. love to put that in a t-shirt, but it's way too long. It's too long. It's too long. Unless you did like half in front, half in back or something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People have to turn around. It's not really cool. Yeah. But well, you did mention going to Spain. And yes. one of those really cool facts, I love asking all the guests if they have something cool or different. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that your listeners from your podcast will definitely know this about you, mm -hmm. but I thought it was pretty cool what you told me. So if you want to share where what you've done... Oh, uh, well, I spend my I spend my time when I'm not at home traveling to wine regions directly. So instead of spending money on um, the sommelier courses, I mean, not knocking them because you no, learn a lot of the no, detail yeah. and how to taste wine and mm -hmm. how to talk about it. I wanted to be there where First it's made. experience. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was more and, you know, and I love to travel to start off with. So to be able to Chase go the wine, <laughs> to go to the wine region and see where it's produced and then I can come home and then describing to some somebody what it's like there these are the style of wines uh, what we get here is either maybe is it better same mm -hmm. worse than what we actually get over there um, here are the different styles that are popular there as compared to here here's what they serve it with these mm -hmm. are the kind of right so there's all kinds of things that you would learn that kind of help to enjoy the experience so you're, more. you're basically learning the culture of that wine region yeah not just you know, how the wine is and what the soil is like and the more technical aspects, you're also learning the culture behind it. Yeah, because I, I mean, it, it's very rare that I'm going to go there and spend a, one day. Yeah. <laughs> spend a couple of days. Well, if you're going to... You can only go to so yeah. many wineries in one day, really. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried. Yeah. And some wine regions are more spread You won't than remember others. it if you do spend... Correct. Yeah. And you do not need to drink all the wine they offer to no. you because usually during those times they're constantly pouring. But it's really... So you've been to 35 countries. 35 countries. Yeah. Uh, it'll be 36 by December. <laughs> yeah, so I try to do one new country every year, um, mm -hmm. but I probably go away probably four or five times a year for sure. But I, I really kind of focus on, and my husband's a big wine drinker as well, so which is a bonus. <laughs> which is a bonus, or otherwise it'd be very hard planning travel yeah. with somebody who was not a wine drinker. But it's uh, one of those things that he has special wines that he wants to go to and I still have quite a few there's so many places in the world that produce wine and I'm sure there's tiny regions that you don't even consider there's a lot of them that don't even hit our radar that we don't even get here in North America yeah. um, which so is let's talk about that a little bit because okay. we are in Canada yeah so I know that our laws for alcohol tend to be pretty tight yes that's just from we are the strictest scotch you know it's similar to in ontario you can't get the same scotch as let's say east coast correct so uh, wine is similar in that yes sense? So, well it has nothing to do with the types it has everything to do with um the set of rules that the lcbo our governing body mm -hmm. puts on what can be produced and or imported or brought into and sold to consumers in this mm -hmm. province so they, it goes through special testing there is a, it's a huge process mm -hmm. to make sure that you're getting decent wine it's not going to make it's you like sick it's like the and alcohol fda of canada pretty basically. much exactly yeah. uh, with a little bit stricter guidelines <laughs> and then they also because they supply to such a large population because mm -hmm. we are the largest population in canada in this province the quantities that they expect from the wine producers is pretty big Mm -hmm. So you not only have to produce so much so often, but most wine producers can't keep up or there's some of the smaller producers are making beautiful wines. They just can't 
hit the limits of what mm-hmm. the LCBO requires to be in our stores. Because we have a lot of stores. Because it's a widespread province. And we drink a lot of wine. And apparently we drink a lot of wine, yeah. <laughs> so it's, can you imagine trying to stock all of those stores with all those wines? I mean, everyone wants to get in, mm-hmm. but again, they have a very strict guidelines of what they're allowing to come in. And I know we do have some pretty incredible wineries in Ontario. We do. Yeah, and you did a podcast on it. So I've done many of them. Yeah, you've done many of them. <laughs> there's one I remember specifically. It's uh, Prince Edward County. Yeah, that was, was just recently. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah, that one was a lot of fun. Um, we got to do just a lot of behind the scenes tastings, which was a lot, which was really great. And there's um, some videos too. So for it, those who don't want to do just podcasts, you can get some. Yes, videos we did. Too. So we started doing videos about a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. uh, which is a different way of. We're so used to just speaking in camera and not worrying about what we look like as females, <laughs> but now we're having to worry about what to wear and also finding people to interview who are okay being on camera has yes. been a bit of a battle. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, so Prince Edward County was good. I've done an entire episode. I've been in Niagara many times. I go to a lot of the festivals or some bonus episodes. Uh, mm-hmm. If there's particular wine shows that I've been to uh, or that my co-host and I have been to. And we'll... you've done like the food and wine combos too. Yeah, we'll do mm-hmm. pairings. Um, we'll talk about different things from classes. Probably about every third episode, I think, mm-hmm. is usually something to do with drink related, whether it's yeah. wine or some other kind of beverage. Usually we, we try to alternate between food, travel, and wine. And I tend to do the wine ones. Cynthia is the cocktail girl. Yeah. And, uh, Stacey used to be a beer rep as well as a wine rep. So it's it's kind of a cool combination that... Uh, you have a lot of different taste buds in there. It's that's the, yeah. That was the whole idea of keeping the three of us together, right? And all these Ontario wines, do we have remarkable sparkling wine at all? Uh, there's quite a few in Ontario. Really? Okay. Um, I happen to love Henry Pelham, the Catherine. It's a brute style. Mm-hmm. I also love, that's the Henry Pelham Cuvée Catherine. And then I also really love, I love one by Peller Estates. It's actually called the Ice Cuvée, which is so Canadian. Ooh, yeah. it, um, actually, the Ice Cuvée Rosé is my favorite. So it is a sparkling rosé wine with a dosage. Remember the dosage? Yes. Of ice wine. I was going to say, it sounds like... Instead ice, of instead of adding wine. extra sugar to it, they just added in a shot of ice and wine. And ice wine is wine. such a Canadian thing. It is. Is it... Are we the only country who does it? Or is it... It's maybe not called ice wine, but yeah. there are other northern countries yeah. around the world who are but starting to produce it. Thing. It is a yeah. Canadian thing to do ice wine. I've actually... When we went to Australia and New Zealand a few years ago, we were told that because of the distance... They love ice wine down there and they don't get it. So we actually had smaller oh. bottles from one of the producers that we managed to get little piccolo sized ones. Oh. And we were handing them out to taxi drivers <laughs> and like we were like the we were like everyone wanted to give us rides because we were handing out ice wine down there. <laughs> I'm not sure how legal that was in Australia, but it was still a lot of fun. Oh, I'm just sure to they see their reaction yeah. of it, right? Things that we take for mm-hmm. granted. So I've never actually brought wine out of the country like that before, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. And people don't realize Outside of Ontario, there's a lot of great wine producers. Of course, everyone knows about BC, BC, but Halifax, Nova Scotia is actually just outside of Halifax. There's a great wine region. Um, It's usually around the area of Wolfville, which is probably about 40 minutes north of Halifax. So you can actually get off in Halifax and then rent a car and drive up. There's quite a few wineries and they have a sparkling wine producer, Benjamin Bridge. And it's good? It is phenomenal. Uh, Yes, I actually did a tasting with the winemaker and I know most of the team there. And it was one of the first episodes I ever did in the podcast. Oh, our listeners have to go all the way back to your, your first few <laughs> But podcasts. one of the things yeah. I thought was cool, because if it's outside of anywhere in Ontario, not just Ontario, sorry, anywhere in Canada, they will ship wines, $15 flat rate. Wow. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah. all I have to do is order three bottles, which and is then, nothing, yeah. and then you charge $15, and they'll ship it direct to your door. Really so yeah, so they've arranged how to ship it elsewhere, hmm. so it's this inter-province thing you always yeah, have to worry about. Yeah, that's a little tricky. Yeah. yeah, but you can find, so Benjamin Bridge does show up quite a bit here in Ontario, and I'm trying to constantly bring it more, but the big claim to fame is that uh, Gordon Ramsay just put one of their wines in his restaurants in New York. Wow. Yes. So it is a very good wine. It is a very good yeah. wine. <laughs> well, it's so nice to see that Canada is putting their own stamp on the wines and the sparkling wines. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are actually, we're very well known for it. Uh, just, there are so many sparkling wine producers in Canada now. It's crazy. Uh, most wineries, even if they weren't producing a sparkling, they, they eventually did. Uh, so it's one of those things, the next time you go to a wine region, um, try to challenge yourself saying, today I'm only going to have sparkling. Yeah. It just makes and it find all the best producers in that region. In that region, mm-hmm. right? Look for the different producers, and they each have probably have different styles as well. So That's you can, true. There's so many ways to do it. There's so many of them that you can do an entire day just of bubbles. I have a super funny story that okay. you reminded me of. When I was a child, my dad made blueberry wine quite often mm-hmm. because we have tons of blueberries here. And he's a scientist, so he decided to experiment with wine. So he had made his wine, and there was that that sludge or whatever at the bottom. Yep. And he put sugar in it and corked it and forgot about it. 
And a year later, when he went to clean out his equipment, because he completely forgot about it, mm-hmm. and there was bubbles, and he was able to strain it, and he made about three or four bottles, and this is when we got married. Yeah. So my dad gave us a bottle, but then I got pregnant, so I'd never got a chance to taste it. <laughs> no. But it started leaking, because it had bubbles, so I guess the it's cork push, was... It's yeah. pushing the cork out. So my and husband the, and my best friend got like very did. drunk one day, because we're like, we have to drink it, and I'm you pregnant. have to drink it, I know. I know, I know. So nobody made it to class that day, because we were all in university. Yeah, it was an interesting day. That would have been really cool. That yeah. would have been probably one of the <laughs> But blueberry sparkling wine. A blueberry it was so sparkling wine. I think it was like 14% or something insane like that. It was The, the alcohol content it was really high. It does be really high. high. Correct. Well, it's, all, yeah. it's the sugar that yeah. usually causes that, right? So usually the higher the sugar content and the mm-hmm. higher the alcohol content, because it usually goes the same. But there are sparkling red wines. Mm-hmm. Um, Italy produces quite a few of them, and they're usually very inexpensive. Okay. So if you like red wine and you want something a little chilled and lighter, there's mm-hmm. some really great ones that are, and we can get them in our stores here all the time, but people never oh. see them. Yeah, no. I, I always I surprise, every time I've done a sparkling wine class, I love to throw in a sparkling <laughs> red at the end just to throw people off. Because people have seen maybe like a sparkling wine, the less expensive ones that are sort of the rosé, but like the lower end wines that, mm-hmm. you know, you can kind of drink on the go and not yes. worry too much about cost. Mm-hmm. And then you see the white wines, which is, you know, the typical champagne yes. for celebrations and yes. such. And... Apparently a red one. <laughs> yes, it's not a champagne. It'll be a, it's it's a, from Italy. Yes. It has to be called uh, sparkling. It's, yeah, sparkling wine. Mm-hmm. Um, but so Italy has different styles, and Prosecco is one of their more popular ones. In Spain, it's Cava. Mm-hmm. Um, in Portugal, they would still be called sparkling. Um, outside of the Champagne region in France, so other regions in France also make sparkling wines, but they call it crema. Ah, okay. So like Alsace makes a crema. Loire Valley makes one. So there's so those ones are actually done in the same method. Mm-hmm. but they can't call it champagne mm-hmm. and they're much cheaper and they're in France and it's they're so from crazy. France you can yeah. have a French sparkling wine but yeah. you just have to look for the crema on label and you're having a French sparkling wine that's just not from that region mm-hmm. so then you can just still pretend that you're having champagne well, you can afford it and how you had said before how you know the monarchies loved the sparkling wine or the champagne mm-hmm. and I had done some really quick research before this podcast and I found it super interesting that some monarchs were crowned at the reigns with champagne, particularly with champagne from the Champagne region. Mm -hmm. And then even later on, you have Mary Queen of Scots who brought her champagne from France to Scotland when she had to move. That's such a particular thing. It's like, oh, I need to bring my own drink. Right? Correct. Well, it was a status symbol, mm-hmm. right? So some people had luxury cars and homes and yeah. royalties, and even the royals were always trying to one-up each other. That's just the way it was. So everybody had their own particular favorite, and it was something that showcased their level of class and royalty mm-hmm. is by if they had their own brand or they're the only ones who can get it, they had a direct line to a producer, uh, kind of like still what it is today. <laughs> Well, Rudy champagne Franks. is still used for weddings and celebrations. It is. Yeah. Um, I think it's just that tradition of it, and it's something that most people don't drink every day, so it makes it a little bit more special. Mm-hmm. Um, I think bubbles just visually are festive. Uh, and I know, it's so fun to see bubbles. It is. So anything. even spark- yeah. when I think about sparkling water, even how it excites kids, yeah. right, to have bubbles in the water, like mm-hmm. they always joke around my... Uh, niece when she was little she used to call it spicy water spicy water spicy water because yeah. you make her nose tingle she said <laughs> because if you're not if your kids aren't drinking you know pop or soda or whatnot then spicy water would make sense spicy water exactly <laughs> and you I can throw to... fruit in there and you can throw all kinds of things in there and make it special yep well I, I used to do that even for catering and large events for anyone who didn't want the alcohol content I used to be able to make like sparkling cocktails mm. and I would just replace out the champagne portion with sparkling, sparkling water, water. Yeah. yeah that's an interesting combo so for Anybody who doesn't want the alcohol, then that would definitely be Yeah, nice. so you can do sparkling water with orange juice. That would yeah. be like your mock mimosa, yeah. right? There's your mock mosa? Your mock mosa. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there's other names for yeah. it. But yeah, you can do juices, fruit purees of different kinds. Uh, Bellini, of course, would be peach. Mm-hmm. But you can get kind of fancy with different ones. And... I'm sure Cynthia would know some of the recipes. Oh, yeah, I'm sure she does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the bubble side's a little bit more of mine, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. She just drinks with me. <laughs> she enjoys it. She does. Yeah. Well, I think that's about it. I mean, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, did you want a book recommendation? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, so you actually have it with you. I wasn't sure if you were sending it to me. No, no. I have the actual book name of the book because I said it was probably one of my favorites and really got me interested in the history of it. Yeah. Going back to one of the first stories I told you about, and it's actually called The Widow Clicquot. Okay. The Widow Clicquot. The so Widow I'll Clicquot. make sure to write in the show notes. Yeah. For the link to look for The Widow yeah. Clicquot. And the um, author's name is Tilar, so T-I-L-A-R, uh, Mazeo, M-A-Z-Z-E-O. 
So it's the whole story from the time that she met him, time she got married. One of the cool things that I, I was fascinated by, and I was actually told the same thing when I was there, this, the plots of land that these families owned, even back then and today, are very small. Mm -hmm. So because everyone had only so much land, if they wanted to get in on this champagne craze and make wine in that area, the value of the land was going up. But if anyone who wanted to make money, parents were basically marrying their daughters to the neighbor's son who also oh, had wow. a winery. So there's a lot of, that's why you'll see a lot of hyphenated names. Yeah. So a lot of combined wineries. Yeah. So Laurent Perrier is yeah. actually two names. Madame or Widow Clicquot, her actual full name was Barb Nicole Pochardin Clicquot. So she was married into a family. Right. She was married into a family and it was her, the husband. Um, so yeah, so she basically was her parents married her off to somebody else and most of them do that. And even they then. They have the knowledge. So that kind of makes sense actually to help. It did, but it was more more of a thing to preserve yeah. land, right? So it would be like one father was chatting with the father from a couple doors down and mm -hmm. he would just say, well, you know what? If we our kids get married, then they get a double the size of the land, right? Yeah. A bigger winery. Yeah, so there's a lot of arranged marriages mm -hmm. back then. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Which is, kind of goes against all that female empowerment that was happening at the same well, the, time, the right? the females, you know, they rose above it, so. Obviously, yes. they took charge, so they that's good. Charge. Anyways, thanks for letting me talk. Yeah. I was going to say, thanks for letting me babble about bubbles. <laughs> babble about bubbles. I like yes. that. No, I really appreciate you coming. I know that your schedule was crazy with all the stuff you have going on. Well, this was a good like little break in between <laughs> before I headed out of town. So I thought, uh, yeah. so yeah. yeah, I'm glad that I managed to uh, come. I'm really happy you managed to come and do yeah, this. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah, no, it was fun. I'm excited for your whole podcast. I'm a history buff. So Thank you. Good. Yeah, it'll be really fun. As you heard, Stephanie recommended the nonfiction book, The Widow Clicquot, The Story of a Champagne Empire and the Woman Who Ruled It by Talar J. Nazeo. And somebody else recommended the fiction titled The Champagne Sisterhood by Chris Keniston. And I'll wrap up. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at History A. You can also visit the website to have those direct links. You can email me, send me your comments. I love hearing from you. And if you scrolled on this podcast, you should have all these show notes that we've mentioned. And we actually have a link to her podcast on sparkling wine. And if you enjoyed the podcast, you can also rate me on iTunes. Apparently they have these algorithmic elves and then they create magic and then something happens. You can try it out. Thank you to my husband, Jamie, and our brood of kids, as well as our families, our friends, for all their encouragement in keeping me adventuring through history. They have this crazy belief in my abilities, so un grand merci.